Let's pray together. Oh God, we gather in this place with glad hearts. We are thankful for your presence with us. And we're thankful now for your word. We open these ancient words now to the 15th chapter of Luke's gospel. And we trust that you will speak to us today through your Holy Spirit. We know that this word is living and active. And as your Holy Spirit inspires it again in our hearts, we will hear from you. We thank you for that. We love you. We praise you. And we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you will, turn with me to Luke chapter 15. Uh, We're going to read verses 11 through 32. Again, we're at our second Sunday of the parable of the prodigal and his brother. And I'd love for you to follow along in your Bibles or on the screen as we hear, hear the word again. Let us hear the word of God. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him out to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of man was dead. This son of mine was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now, his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen, For all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today we move to the fringes of the parable, the parable of the prodigal and his brother. We move out there to the fringe so that we can work our way in just a little bit. We, we think about the younger brother's newfound friends in the faraway country. And that citizen of the faraway country who hired him to work in his farm, on his farm. We, uh, we wonder how they experienced the journey of the younger brother There's something here, I think, for us to learn, something for us to glean from 
uh, from their experience of him. I realize it is a little bit of a stretch from the text, but, but not much. Little brother, we know, takes his great wealth and riches, which he has shamefully robbed from his family, and he goes to this faraway country looking for life on his own terms. We wonder who did he meet when he got there? Who did he encounter? We, we don't know, but he must have made friends as he squandered his property in dissolute living. You always make friends when you squander your property in dissolute living. Probably there were, there were others there in that place with a similar story. You know how like people attract like people. I'm sure he ran into some, to some folks and the first conversation went something like this. Why, well, yeah, I left home three years ago. I just couldn't take it anymore. My father was even worse than your father. I couldn't stand him. I couldn't stand my older brother. He was such a jerk and I hated farm work. I had to get away. I just hated that life that I had in that place. I wanted to try things on my own for a while. I, I wanted to do it my way. And besides, family, family, you can't live with them and you can't kill them. Oh, my goodness, family. I'm so glad we found each other. Now we're having a good time. We're having a big time together, partying every night, enjoying life. Isn't it wonderful? No responsibilities, nobody to tell us what to do, how to act. We can just live. We can just live. Hey, could you spot me a 20? I'm a little short this week. Uh, the tips didn't come in too good. Okay. <laughs> they didn't come in too good last night. We don't know exactly what happened. But we do know how this works, don't we? We've played this out in our, our minds. You, you flash a little cash when you go to a new place. You buy a round for everybody at the bar. Maybe two rounds for everybody at the bar. And all of a sudden, you got more friends than you could ever count. Everybody's your buddy after that, aren't they? It feels good. People, people value you. They accept you for just who you are. You are not somebody's youngest son. You are just you. And people have accepted you in this new place as your own person. A few drinks later and you're, you're, you're spilling your guts to people that you just met. If you want to write down, that's not a good idea to spill your guts to people you just met. But you do it anyway. They find out as you tell your story that you basically shamed your entire family. You shamed them all. You wished your father was dead. You wished your father was dead when you said, give me what is mine. I want what will be mine. I wish you were dead. And somehow, like, like the three-year-old who threatens to run away from home, your father gave you what was yours probably thinking you'd get down to the edge of town and turn around and come right back when you thought better of what you had done. But you didn't. You didn't. You left. You went far away. It was really, really bad stuff what you did. What you've done was so bad. These, uh, these party animals that you've encountered in the faraway country, why, even they hadn't done what you did. Sure, they had taken a few coins and, and left to make their own way in the world, but they hadn't done what you did. They didn't shame their entire family out of pure selfishness like you did. They didn't do that. For some, for some of these folks, you become a pariah to be avoided. For others, you are the chief among exiles. They are so impressed. You are bad, bad Leroy Brown, the baddest man in the whole dang town. That's who you are. And you got money. Oh, you got money. Dissolute living. Dissolute living is expensive. It costs a lot, but it's fun. It is asotos in the Greek, asotos. It means riotous living. Who knew asotos could be so much fun? <laughs> it's great. It's great until the money runs out. Now, your new friends are sophisticated party animals. They know what's getting ready to happen, don't they? They know. They can smell tragedy on the horizon and they run for the hills as fast as they can. 
But there are a few, you know, a few stick around, and, and they, uh, they say, you know, let's pool our resources. Maybe let's get an apartment together. If we split everything, it won't be but $300 a month, and we could make it four of us in one apartment. That'd be great. We can still have enough to go out on Friday night. But now we wonder, can you get a job like we have? Can you get a job? We, we all have jobs, and you don't. So maybe you could get a job like we have. Well... I might could, but nobody's hiring. It's a famine, you know. We're in the middle of a famine. Nobody's hiring. I don't know that I can get a job. Okay, well, we'll pay your part this month, but you're going to have to bring, you're going to have to bring some money in to help make this work. Have you turned any applications in? Have you put any applications out there for people to see? Have, have you thought about multi-level marketing or something like that? No. Have you, what about stuff in those envelopes? You can send off in the mail and stuff envelope. You, maybe you could write a blog post and get some money from that. People apparently make a living. I don't know. Have you tried anything? No, we're in a famine. We're in a famine. Well, you know what? There's a pig farmer. There's a pig farmer on the edge of town. He is hiring, and I think you could live in the barn out there. Oh, a pig farmer. Now, remember, fellas, remember, I am Jewish. I don't do pigs. Oh, really? Oh, really? Suddenly, you are Jewish. You didn't mention that with adultery and stealing and lying and all of that. But okay, no pigs, whatever, no pigs. You remember, we're Gentile, and we don't do freeloaders. <laughs> you got 24 hours. 24 hours, either come up with $300 or get out, brother. That's all we've got to say to you. Little brother, little brother goes out to the pig farmer. The pig farmer's already heard the story. He really does not want this boy around. He's got daughters to protect. Lewis, he's got daughters to protect. He doesn't want him around. He really doesn't. This is not an honorable boy. So he gives him, he gives him the worst job in the history of jobs. Slopping those hogs. He thinks, uh, he thinks, Little brother will just move on instead of endure the shame of slapping those hogs. But he doesn't. He doesn't. Little brother swallows his pride and he sets to work slapping those hogs. He goes up a few notches in the farmer's book because, hey, at least he'll work. And I can respect anybody that will work. We know what happens, don't we? Little brother is in the middle of a bite of rotted okra out of the hog slop. And he comes to his senses and says, you know, I could work just as hard for my father and at least I would have food to eat and a place to sleep. He decides, he decides to go home. You know the rest of the story too, don't you? The profound reception that he received the incredible welcome and that, that restoration that goes beyond anything that made any sense ever in the history of the world. We know that story so well and I've always wondered, did little brother's friends in the faraway country, did they ever hear about what happened? Did, did the pig farmer get a note from little brother telling him? I've always wondered, what would little brother write? In a letter to his roommates. What would little brother write in that letter? Dear friends. I'm not really sure where to start. I, I suppose with an apology. Mr. Farmer, I'm sorry that I ran out on you. But I thank you for taking a chance on me. Roommates, I will be sending you the money that I owe you. I'm sorry I took advantage of your kindness. But in a strange way, your willingness to kick me out set me on this journey home that I just can't believe. A few weeks ago, I left your country and I, I made my way home and determined to spend my, the rest of my life as a servant in my father's house. But when I topped the hill at the edge of town, my father, he came running to me. He ran. I've never seen him run before. I tried to get to give him my speech, to beg him to let me be a servant. But he wouldn't listen. He just kissed me over and over again, and he hugged me. Can you believe it? He put the family ring back on my finger. 
He put new clothes on me. He killed the fatted calf. He threw the party to end all parties. You all know better than anyone what I did to my family. You know how my selfishness broke my father's heart. The financial cost was more than anyone could bear. But the relational cost has been devastating. Yet, somehow, I'm forgiven. I've been restored. I am once again the youngest son of my father. Now, our family still bears the shame of my actions. And my older brother... He hasn't come along yet. It's going to take a few years for the people in this community and some in my family to forgive me for what I did and to forgive my father for what he did in taking me back. But father says we will figure it out. He says the most important thing is that he has me back and that I'm home. So for you, my fellow travelers on life's journey, I wish for you home. I wish for you love that knows no end. I wish for you grace that sees beyond failure. I wish for you hope. I know some of you can never go home, but I've talked to my father, and he has promised me that when you're ready, you have a home here with us. So come and see ever and always your little brother. Do you see, sisters and brothers, the way that we receive people, the way that we receive people when they come home has profound implications that go far beyond what we can see with our eyes. Is it costly? Yes. Is it hard? Hardest thing we'll ever do. Does it cause conflict? Sometimes. Yes, it does. But is it not who we are as God's children to receive all people, all people into our hearts with love, grace, and hope no matter what? Yes, that's right. That is it. Our fellow travelers on life's journey are paying attention to this, to the state of our hearts, more than they are to anything we ever say or do. And many of them, along with many of us, are looking desperately for a place to call home. Jesus has shown us what it should look like when we get there. Together, together. Are we ready? Are you ready? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, may the people of God say, Amen.